White House will update its policy for space with its new Space Priorities Framework. President Biden's goals focus on developing and enhancing capabilities to protect national interests. Caitlin Johnson is Deputy Director of the Aerospace Security Project at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Caitlin, nice to have you. Thank you for having me on. So was there any one thing that really struck you um, about this priorities document? You know, I think the biggest thing is that the document was really a continuity of a lot of policy we've seen on space through the past couple of administrations. And so what has been great is the continual building on what previous administrations have done. You know, space is a pretty bipartisan area of support within Congress and, and generally through D.C., um, and we really saw that reflected in the framework. So were you surprised at the emphasis on military applications as opposed to just civil and commercial applications? Yeah, I think often you assume that um, the Democrats or the Biden administration might focus on things like climate change, STEM education, which were both mentioned in the document, or on civil and commercial space versus military space. But because of the Russian anti-satellite test that happened not too long ago, I think they did feel a little bit more pressured to focus or adjust their framework to include more national security space than what we might have seen if that test had not happened. So what did you see as far as um, an emphasis on improved acquisition processes and then also collaboration and cooperation with other actors? There was definitely a lot of emphasis on working with our allies and partners and I think that is you know continuous throughout other areas of policy from the Biden administration. Um, when it comes to acquisition, you know, that is a huge focus for the Space Force, for Congress, and for the new administration. And so um, we did see that a bit in, in the document, but even more, I think we saw that out of the NDAA, which was just passed. And is that actually going to become a reality? Because a lot of people talk about improving acquisition processes for high-tech systems. It's definitely hard. Um, I don't think anyone has one right answer. And the problem is, is that you have to fiddle the dials. I you know, in, in several different areas until you get what was what is right. I, you know, they are bringing in some expertise from the NR, NRO into the Space Force. They have a lot of support from Congress. They have the money to fund these new programs and to improve their acquisition process. So I think there's a lot of support and momentum. We'll just have to wait and see. Well, speaking of money, you know, what kind of investments are we likely to see as a result of these priorities? Sure, so I think we see a lot of investments in resiliency. It seems to be the big new buzzword for space and I think across the DOD enterprise of making sure that our space systems are resilient to attack, that we have redundant systems, that we have redundant capability in case of attack, that we don't lose that space capability that provides you know, such a, um, a strong foundation of support for our modern military, um, but also you know, we see a lot of investment in things like, um, like as I said, STEM education and climate change that we didn't quite see in the previous administration. Um, climate change in particular, I mean, space is where we get all that data to monitor the Earth and to be able to, to affect and, and uh, research our, our own planet and, and how, you know, our, our human capacity is affecting it. Um, and so we see that money. The terms uh, leader and leadership yes. are mentioned a lot in this framework document. Why? What's, what does that tell you about the priorities? Sure. So I think the United States has recognized that it can be a strong leader in space internationally and especially amongst allies and partners. We've certainly had the longest history or one of the longest histories in space and there is a real uh, drive for the United States to be a leader on international norms. of good behavior in space, of setting precedent for how to act or keep peace or, you know, keep sta space sustainable. And um, I think with the, the emphasis on leadership throughout the document, the Biden administration really sees that opportunity and wants to capitalize on it. So you write that in the, in the framework, uh, it talks about protecting against uh, space-enabled threats, yes. but it doesn't really give specifics about developing the right counter space capabilities. Correct. Uh, is that a problem? You know, I think it depends on where you where you sit. So we at CSIS did some research last year looking at what could ha possibly, what could you do to better protect your satellites, make them less vulnerable. And there are kind of two options. One is passive defenses, so making them um, harder to attack, 
or active defenses, actively defending your assets. So thinking about like bodyguard satellites and things that will target an incoming warhead in space. And so when you talk about counter space capabilities to protect satellites, it's that second category, which gets a little messy when we think about um, deterrence and the balance of stability in space and, and what kind of stance the uh, Biden administration wants to take there. All right. Well, Caitlin, thank you. We're going to look for the national defense strategy and get yes. a little bit more clarity on this. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Mary. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss out on any future Government Matters interviews.